composing and performing. It's my great honor to get to introduce the speakers and also moderate the discussion. First, we'll begin with George Lewis, who is the Edwin H. Case Professor of American Music at Columbia University, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a corresponding fellow at the British Academy. Lewis's and other honors, other honors include a MacArthur Fellowship in 2002, a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2015, the United States, a United Artists Walker Fellowship in 2011, an Albert Award of the Arts in 1999, and fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. Lewis studied composition with Muhal Richard Abrams at the AACM School of Music in Trombone with Dean Hay. A member of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians since 1971, Lewis's work in electronic and computer music, computer-based multimedia installations, and notated and improvised forms is documented in more than 150 recordings. Lewis received the 2012 Seamus Award from the Society of Electroacoustic Music in the United States, and his book, A Power Stronger Than Itself, The AACM and American Experimental Music, received the American Book Award and the American Musicological Society's Music in American Culture Award. Music was, Lewis was elected to honorary membership in the Society in 2016. Lewis is also the co-editor of the two-volume Oxford Handbook of Critical Improvisation Studies, and his opera afterward, which he'll, which he'll speak about today, commissioned by the Gray Center for the Arts and Inquiry at the University of Chicago, has been performed in the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Czech Republic. Professor Lewis came to Columbia in 2004. Please welcome Professor George Lewis. I want to thank uh, David Duncan, Heather Leva, and Armin Schwartz for making all this possible. It's an incredible amount of work. And all the other people who I should be thanking, I don't know all their names, but I should thank them too for their incredible work. And also, yesterday's group of speakers who were incredible and learned a great deal. I'm very happy to uh, be asked to be a part of this with this illustrious panel here. It was just super duper. So, so, <laughs> so yeah. So, uh, I'm gonna, I was going to talk about afterward for a little bit, but I, I think it's, I wanted to frame that within my current hobby horse uh, uh, um, um, talk, which kind of got developed at the, for the Dono Eschigen, uh, they let me give the Dono Eschigen lecture, mainly because the guy who was supposed to do it, the documentary curator, said he couldn't come. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> it is true. So, <laughs> but in any event, it was cool. And uh, so I've decided to unburden myself a few things I've been thinking about. And this idea about creolization will come up as a part of the talk. And um, so the talk is creolized in the operatic uh, subject. Um, Sir Donald Francis Tovey, that's a nice picture of him, uh, his, <laughs> his 1949 essay, The Mainstream of Music, which I recommend to all of you, um, posited an end to at least Western classical music history, as well as foreshadowing Leonard Meyer's notion of fluctuating stasis, which he, I think he saw as an absence of stable canon, and I'm pretty sure that Tovey evidently held that with the hope that this would be a temporary condition as he wrote near the end of the essay, having thus sketchily traced the mainstream of music what we may regard as the ocean of Wagner, I can go no farther. At the present day, all musicians feel more or less at sea, and not all of us are good sailors. <laughs> Someday the ocean bed may rise again, and the Thames and the Rhine and other rivers may be seen to reunite as they did in the, cave, in the days when bisons were painted by realistic artists in the caves of Altamira. So I have read, and I seem to understand that 21st century music is in an analogous condition. And I want to suggest a possible development of this post-war condition toward an incipient post-colonial condition described by Frederick Jameson in 1984 as beginning, quote, in the third world, with the great movement of decolonization in British and French Africa. Going further, all these, quote, natives became human beings, and this internally as well as externally, those inner colonized of the first world, minorities, marginals, women, fully as much as its external subjects and official natives. So to help us take a closer look at this, I want to turn to our Columbia colleague, uh, Gayatri Spivak, and in particular, her 2006 article, World Systems and the Creole, which proposes creolity as a discourse which will better account for the development of language 
and, ro and more robustly supplant traditional kinship discourse. And kinship discourse is important to this talk um, because of the notion of the relation between kinship and genre, membership, subjectivity. These are the themes I'm going to be developing today. They're all kind of connected up, particularly when you throw race and gender into the picture. And so I'd like to suggest that this kind of kinship discourse underlies traditional genre assignation, something that Spivak does, is not really discussing. So following on, I want to venture that 21st century new music is becoming marked by a condition of creolite itself. And I'm speaking here about Eloge de la Creolite, an influential 1989 manifesto crafted by Caribbean writers Jean Bernabé, Patrick Chamoiseau, there's, if you, the current, I'm, I'm going to confess here that I read Harper's Magazine from time to time, and there's, there's a wonderful, amazing essay by Chamoiseau in the current issue, and Raphael Confiance begins with this ringing declaration, neither Europeans, nor Africans, nor Asians, we proclaim ourselves Creoles. This will be for us an interior attitude, better a vigilance, or even better, a sort of mental envelope in the middle of which our world will be built in full consciousness of the outer world. The son or daughter of a German and a Haitian, born and living in Peking, will be torn between several languages, several histories, caught in the torrential ambiguity of a mosaic identity. To present creative depth, one must perceive that identity in all its complexity. He or she will be in the condition of a Creole, the situation of Creole. Thus, Following, following Spivak says that creolity will yield us a history and a world, I would like to present some examples of what a new creolized operatic subject can yield to composers, theorists, and listeners. And now comes the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, composer Louis Andreessen has remarked that the first movement of his magisterial work, De Matiri, 1986 to 1988, the act of shipbuilding of all things, serves as a musical metaphor for the eruption of intellectual and also physical violence. But how could shipbuilding be a symbol for violence? Director Heinel Goebbels and his innovative presentation of super titles for one of the central texts of the first movement, Nicolas Witzen's 1690 book, Shipbuilding and Management, provided an unexpected perspective when I went to the, uh, the armory performance at the, um, the armory performance of Dumateri, which Heiner uh, was directed. Most commentary on Dimitri treats the shipbuilding text as a found object whose content merely serves to illustrate the historical period. However, one of my parlor tricks is I do speak and read a little Dutch. And so I was, I was taken by surprise. There was, this, there was amazing, these running super titles, going to right angles, oblique angles, everywhere, all throughout it. Although seemingly all over the the, the stage and the, and, the, and the performance space, and so I was taken by surprise at the appearance of the word brandeiser, which means branding iron, a tool that is really not needed for shipbuilding. So who was this guy, Nicolas Witzel? Are we here in the right place? I, I think I made the wrong order for my stuff here. Anyway, let's find out. <laughs> okay, we're going to stop that one, and we're going to do this one. Here we go. Good. We're back in order. It happens at 3 o'clock in the morning. So, um, Witzel was born in Amsterdam in 1641, the son of Cornelis Janszoon Witzel, who held, among other high offices, the post of administrator of the Dutch West India Company, founded in 1621, with a charter which conferred jurisdiction over the Atlantic slave trade between the Gold Coast, or now Ghana, and the Caribbean, Brazil, and North America. Younger Vincent, Nicolas Vincent, eventually rose to board membership of the even more powerful Dutch East India Company. So within a mere decade after the 1581 Act of Abjuration, the Dutch Declaration of Independence from Spain, the Netherlands had developed the largest merchant machine marine in the world, and the slave trading of both organizations became a major pillar in what has been described as the Netherlands' golden age. And this is a bitter irony, given the act's portrayal of life under the Spanish crown as tantamount to slavery itself. So with this context, a creolized listening mental envelope can hear De Martini's long and overtly violent series of percussively dominated choral accents that deliver the shipbuilding instructions, 
not only as a hammering together of a ship, but also as a sublimated depiction of the appalling violence and objectification of human beings. Is it working? Are we having, are we having a problem? Oh, you want? No, no, no. Oh, okay. I was just telling them they can move if they want to see better. Oh, yeah, you might want to see it. Yeah, right. Okay. I like this. Um, <laughs> well, I wanted to get back to that sublimated depiction of the appalling violence and objectification of human beings that attended not just the building of European nations, but even in a staggering moral contradiction, the emergence of the Enlightenment. So this is this is uh, this is uh, from a French uh, book, uh, Revolt on what they call slave ships. They call them Negliers. And if you go to uh, Dakar, uh, they have this. They have the uh, Glory Island, and you can go there to where the slave where the slaves were basically prepared for transport to the New World. They have this sort of terrifying point of no return, it's just like kind of a hole in the wall, and then once you go out of that hole, you don't come back, and so, but things, this is, you can read that as French, it's a revolt on, uh, on Negrier, and so this one is from the actual book by Nicolas Fitzgerald. paid by music scholars, critics, and commentators in this very obvious history stretches back more than 30 years. And, but what a creolized mental envelope yields here to a later generation of listeners and commentators is a sense of an operatic subject that has been either insouciantly or deliberately ignored, except by the director of the original production, who cast a black man as the captain of the ship. So um, the expression of the new operatic subjectivities I'm addressing here needs an exemplary musical as well as scholarly literature that is, includes explicit and revised historicities. Uh, along with Andreessen, there's Anthony Davis's groundbreaking opera X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X, from 1983, uh, around the same time as a lot of the operas we were discussing yesterday, as well as Amistad from 1997, which were pioneers in, in this respect. But I think I want to speak briefly about the opera Beatrice Chansey from 1998, composed by a Canadian uh, James Rolfe, with the very one book by George, George Elliott Clark, uh, the Afro-Canadian who is now the poet laureate of the country, to which I was introduced by my excellent graduate student, Jane Forner. Um, sitting back there, there he is. He's the just shut down. <laughs> um, set in the British colony of Nova Scotia in 1801, Beatrice Chansey is a fictional slave narrative. And you can think here about pioneering scholarship by Henry Louis Gates and Charles Davis, the father of Anthony Davis, uh, that traces the transformation of Beatrice, a slave, from girlhood toward womanhood, a life marked by sexual jealousy and violation by her father, who is also her owner, violent revolution and of her eventual execution. The Canadian musicologist Donna Zapp, who now works at a Duke, uh, sees this work as, quote, relevant to Canadian social issues and debates concerning race and racism and the formation of Canadian history in the public imagination. In Beatrice Chansey, Rolf and Clark create further critical distance from Eurocentrism. Rolf explores musical difference as fluid relationship rather than a static essence." Unquote. So in this scene, the opera confronts relations among gender, race, and sexuality and power that anticipate the work of Sadia Hartman, not notably her influential scenes of subjection, and this scene portrays the rape of Beatrice by her owner slash father. 
previous histories that tended to frame the ACA as you know, being involved or vitally concerned with the revision of jazz. Well, they, they were actually concerned with the revision of themselves. <laughs> and, um, so the original model for the libretto was one of the books concluding afterward chapter, which I introduced with a discussion of James Clifford's influential essay on ethnographic authority. I use this essay as a touchstone for establishing my working method for the chapter, as Clifford writes here, one increasingly common way to manifest the collaborative production of ethnographic knowledge is to quote regularly and at length from informants. But such quotations are always staged by the quoter and tend to serve merely as examples or confirming testimonies. Looking beyond quotation, one might imagine a more radical polyphony. But this too would only displace ethnographic authority, still confirming the final virtuoso orchestration by a single author of all the discourses in his or her text. So I had to admit that's exactly what I was doing when I said so in the book. Imagining what an ASM meeting might be like with everyone present living an ancestral sample from the many self-critical musings I heard in my interviews. However, the voices I quoted exceeded any authorial attempt to fully control them. Um, so my Let's look at here. My method of, of translation was also informed by the Mexican composer Marcelo Rodriguez's translation of newly unearthed letters by the artist Frida Kahlo in Las Cartas de Frida from 2011. Uh, Rodriguez noted that she actually made no alterations to the letters. She basically sent them to music. I don't know if I have it. Can I play that? Let's see if I can play it. <laughs> signers of the ACM chart of the saxophone is standing up here. Those who might know a little bit about this era of music, we could see right to the right of him, Henry Threadgill, uh, Pete Cozy, Chico Freeman. And on the far left, I guess that's me, sort of falling asleep, because I, I had an early job the next day, and this, you know, I was working in a slide factory, and so that's got a lot of work to do. got to get up and get to be there at 7, member of the Steelworkers Union and all that. Um, so I want to show one short example of how we translated archival recordings into the libretto. So I'm going to jump ahead and here. And this example comes from recordings of the first organizational meeting held in Chicago on May 8, 1965. Now here, Gene is providing a sense of his own dreams and aspirations. I hope you can hear this. I think we're getting closer to, this, uh, to an explanation of this term, original music, among some of us. It means something a little deeper than uh, other. Original, in one sense, means uh, something you write in the particular system that we are locked up with now in this society. We express ourselves in this system because it's, we, it's what we learn. And as we learn more of other systems of music around the world, I mean, it's, it's quite natural today, and we are getting closer to the music that our ancestors played and which we are denied the right to really stretch out in. And this term, original, I feel the, that the authors of this business structure here had in mind more so sound conscious musicians if necessary, finding a complete new system to express its thoughts. If you don't express in that is known, you're ostracized. <laughs> so, uh, not an academic talk. Uh, just people talking to each other, expressing their dreams and hopes and aspirations, and being very clear on the relationship between musical systems and political systems and social systems, and the possibility for throwing off the yokes that bind them in these cases. So, um, I wasn't quite as, um, I, unlike Marcella Rodriguez, I had to, you know, I had to make some alterations, but you'll hear them. Society. 
And as Canada, as Anna writes here, as a British composer of African Caribbean heritage, diversity in classical music is important to me. I decided to create a role specifically for someone of African Caribbean origin. His story touches on cultural, political, and social issues that are still relevant today. Um, Kendall was also inspired by the example of the British ensemble Chinica, Europe's first BAME, or Black and Minority Ethnic Orchestra, founded in 2015 by the classical bassist Chi Chi Nuanoku. Um, despite, for, despite performing a traditional repertoire, Kendall noted in a newspaper article, Chinica achieved a new audience for classical music by changing who was on stage. Indeed, opera goers worldwide rarely see casts composed with a majority of people of color, except for at Corgi and Bess. Thus, representation becomes crucial to decentering whiteness in our operatic experience. Afterward, implicitly countered the myth of absence of the Afro-diasporic among composers, performers, and operatic subjects. And when Kendall says that diversity in classical music is important to her, she explicitly positions herself as a full subject in the classical music community. By doing so, she changes the terms upon which subjectivity is achieved and maintained not just for her, but for white composers as well. Her choice of Guiana as subject brings the creolization project home. Really, um, uh, really existentially 
in the situation of a Creole, we can witness the emergence of a new mobile operatic subject that exemplifies Spivak's notion of creality as, quote, the de-lexicalization of the foreign. Uh, this mental envelope, I think, will produce new envelopes, of new models of scholarship, new media technologies, new methodologies and aesthetics, and new audiences uh, that can affirm our common humanity in pursuit of new music. Now, this, as you probably noticed, is um, uh, it's actually, this is a, a brief, I uh, sped up uh, Terry Adkins' is a piece called Black Beethoven. So you can say maybe a little loop out of it. So uh, that's it for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Excellent. That's really interesting um, presentation. I think I wanted to follow up on uh, your final comment and Lydia's question to ask about the the specific claim, which was already self-evident, but uh, of, of your interest in the kind of, um, what we call it the kind of uh, lexical transparency of the delivery of you know language within your piece and right. uh, uh, and within Hannah Kendall's piece as well, which was audible. I was I, I guess I wanted to ask about that uh, a bit as well. That is, if the delexicalization of the foreign is at stake, um, uh, right. and if, as you said at the outset, that that, that the language of the AACM was also, in some sense, you know, a language that alerted us to the kind of primacy of, of a, a power of language that is inherited, and the search for a kind of alternative language that would be a, a language of a kind of integrity of expression. Mm. I, mm. I, I guess I wonder about the what would seem to be the circulation of the kind of unmarked um, integrity of language, you know, that, that seems to be like the language of the oppressor. Do you know what I mean? Which is to say, it seems like musically there is, there is the marking of uh, a, kind of, uh, a kind of relationship of, I don't know, oppositionality, mm -hmm. if we could call it that. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess I wonder about that on the level of the language itself. I mean the spoken language yes. or the musical language. So but, no, let the, me the, go there first by saying that there isn't an ASM language. So uh, to, there isn't one. Right, so, but you, but that was your premise of your question. I felt that there was an ASM language that we were sort of striving to, to sort of represent or work with or revise. That really didn't that, exist. Right. No. No. I certainly so, didn't mean that. I meant the know, quote that you gave us at the outset, in which, which um, in in which there was ref, in which. Uh, was oh, uh, reflecting on yeah was the idea of finding finding a complete new system that expresses us and so um, but what they found I think at the end and this was I guess by now about uh, 60 years ago uh, were a lot of systems not just one and so I this was came up actually when uh, Muhal Richard Abrams were having a phone conversation about this and he said well how are you going to represent all the sounds of the ASM and I said I'm not just going to represent myself, which is what we've done from the very beginning. We represent ourselves as individuals, and the composite notion of coming together produces an emergent sense of change. Now, in terms of the language of the oppressor, once again, I don't find this language particularly oppressive any more than I find uh, the people that I know who are doing these doing uh, related kinds of work. You know, I don't go to concerts of, I don't know, uh, Hino Papa and say that this is the language of oppression I'm dealing with. No, I just look at it as another kind of language. And so I feel free as a participant in, and subject, and this is a larger point. In other words, if I'm being oppressed, that means that I lack subjectivity, I become an object. And so the problem is when the object speaks back, that's at the moment when, as Fred Moten says, uh, subjectivity is reasserted. So for me, I didn't find personally, um, and of course the alternative would be to engage in kind of pastiche models of representation that somehow uh, fix, create fix an essential relationship between eras, uh, let's say postmodernism, modernism, and forms of music making. Uh, so basically, the choice of language is uh, really quite personal, but I'm going to say that I don't see it as being the it's not a question of uh, using the master's tools. It's a question of using my tools to do to construct my own house. You too. You're the one in the back of it. So I was curious um, if the creolization of the operatic subject can also extend to a creolization of the operatic voice. Um, it struck me really, uh, really interesting to listen to the performances and the ways in which sort of things like diction and sort of vowel pr production are following a certain model of how to train an operatic voice, and the training of that voice is itself 
pretty deeply embedded inside certain structures of uh, discrimination, certain structures of um, holding up one standard of <coughs> what a proper sounding voice should be, what a proper operatic voice should be. And I'm wondering whether there's space inside the conception of the creolized operatic subject for a broader sense of what the operatic voice could, could sound like. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> is that is that it? Is that is, is that what you'd like to ask? <laughs> I mean, the answer is yes. I'd say why not? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a I think there's a larger point being made here. Um, uh, yesterday, when I was listening to a lot of work that I would like to have seen realized, I didn't hear any real difference in how the uh, the voice the voice was treated. Somehow, though, when black people do it, it seems a little different. And so, basically, that's the whole point of my intervention here. <laughs> Or when people of color do it, somehow it's like, well, well, suddenly you guys should sound different, right? I mean, you are different. <laughs> and so, and so that's the that's the point I'm trying to push back against is where where we locate difference and why and who needs to be consistently exoticized and held up to uh, differential standards. Um, I, I would say that beyond that. Um, I think there's lots of room for the kind of thing you're talking about. Um, what I felt was interesting was that uh, I hadn't seen the language that you're talking about, the canonical vocal language used to express subjects and systems and points of view that I was interested in, that I had experienced, and that other people around me had experienced. And so in that sense, the creolization, as far as I'm concerned, is already present because it's you can't just talk about the sound, you've also got to talk about the context, the social context, which is what I've been talking about for the past few minutes here. So by ignoring the social context and just focusing on the sound, that really is high modernism. Maybe one more. Um, yeah, I was wondering also, you know, given the kinds of, I guess, discourses that are on display here, in terms of obviously since the, the main subject is in some way opera, um, the either claims to or participating in some kind of idea of high art um, in the various examples that you've shown, or at least some aspirations towards, or like specifically maybe not commercial forms of music making, where something like um, the Kendrick Lamar winning the Pulitzer Prize, do you see that fitting into or pushing back against some larger realization theme that you've engaged with? I'm kind of wondering where, where something where it's what's about this kind of non commercial. No, I don't quite understand. Non-commercial means what? So the, the claims of the AACM uh, to contrast their work against, let's say, commercial forms of jazz or something like that. I don't think they ever made those claims. Okay. No, I, I mean like, um, but so uh, people were just trying to do what they were doing. I think that the claims of many commentators seem to revolve around uh, binaries that they constructed about uh, commercial and non-commercial forms of jazz, and I just said that over two hours of talking about their music, they weren't thinking about jazz. And so basically if they weren't thinking about it, then it seems that that discourse is coming from the outside. And so that's exactly the sort of oppressions that, that, that I think the ASM is trying to, and other organizations were trying to Sorry, throw off. Now, let me go a little bit, system. well, but I mean, I don't know, offers cost money. But I mean, like, beyond that, <laughs> So, and the thing that's interesting about them is that um, yesterday when I was uh, listening to um, uh, David Deckman's excellent talk, uh, one of the first things he talked about, which came up periodically throughout the discussion, was the sort of uh, neoliberalism. And uh, it turns out there's a, there's a small but growing kind of literature on neoliberalism and the arts and all of that. And one of the things that we start to see in neoliberalism is a pushback against the idea of collective systems that are designed for the public good. Let's say, for example, Jan Pasler, a musicologist, and her identification of uh, the public utility of uh, arts funding in, uh, in, in France. And so a lot of the work that I saw uh, uh, was in some way predicated on the notion that there was a public good connected with um, uh, uh, investment in arts funding. And so um, I don't think I want to comment on Kendrick Lamar because I think it has very little to do with what I'm thinking about, but um, except to say that um, 
one of the issues that I think I'm sure maybe the Pulitzer Committee faced was the idea of what actually constituted the community of subjectivity uh, that the Pulitzer Prize um, represented. And um, so you had various stakeholders involved in that. And as being someone who was on the jury twice, uh, what you notice is that uh, the jury panel is allowed to present three options, and the journalists, not the musicians, make the final decision. Uh, so that's an interesting notion of the community of the arts, uh, you know, a symbolization of the community of the arts and how that community can be extended, modified, contested, negotiated uh, in many ways. Um, so I guess this is a hard thing to, I want to try to wrap this up in an interesting way, I'm not sure I can, um, except to say that um, <coughs> At some point, um, I guess part of the reason why I chose the musical language that I did was to reinforce the idea of taking people out of the normalization of the relationship between race and sound. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> I think we have to move on, but uh, thank, thank you, George. I'll turn mine on. Thank you. Who's going next? I can go next. Okay. Because I feel like George has already answered all of my things that I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Du Yun, born and raised in Shanghai. Currently based in New York City as a composer, multi-instrumentalist, performance artist, curator, working at the intersection of orchestral, opera, chamber music, theater, cabaret, pop music, oral tradition, visual arts, <laughs> electronics, and noise. She is the winner of the 2017 Pulitzer Prize in Music, awarded for her opera Angel's Bone. Hailed by the New York Times as a leading figure in China's new generation of composers, and often cited as a key activist in New York's new movement in new music, she was selected by National Public Radio by as 100 composers under 40. Known as chameleonic in her protean artistic outputs, her music is championed by some of today's finest performing artists, ensembles, orchestras, and organizations. She was a founding member of ICE and currently serves as the artistic director of MATA, a pioneering organization dedicated to commissioning and championing young composers from around the world. Please welcome Du Yun. I just feel like I just have to begin with being like um, to say that I'm such a fangirl <laughs> to like so many people in the room and um, I'm born and raised in Shanghai and, and I came to the States when I was 20 and that was like China before the China we know now and um, and I remember um, I it, when, when the 95 it happened we had all this like a bootleg like, cassette, so I would go on the street by the Shanghai Conservatory and I would get all those cassettes, judging by their cover, of course, <laughs> right? So I would see like a triangles, I'm like, oh, that must be a good album, <laughs> but I was like on the side of moon, I was like, oh, that's great, and then it was side by side with like a singer of um, and Young, you know, Enigma. To see you too, that like John um, Barbara was on, and I was like such a big fan. And then I went to Oberlin as an undergrad. So one of my um, uh, 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 close friends at the time, he said, "Do you? I think you should really listen to this guy." I'm like, "Who is this guy?" <laughs> so you know, I, and then I was like exposing myself to Tom Waits and to you know to all those people. I'm like, "Yes, give give me more, give me more, yeah." And then he's like, you have to listen to Black and White by her novels. And I listened to it, I was like, whoa, yes. <laughs> it was like this most like, quick cut of all those things. And then I was also immersed myself with the John Zorn scene. I was like, oh my god, like that's by Ronald. Like you could do that. So that was just to tell you that. 
that was my where my heart was. Mm -hmm. And then and then come here and she see um, uh, and George playing in a band. I was like, oh no, you can be a composer and a professor and actually also a musician. I never did the professor really right. I felt like so. So that is my answer. I think to a lot of how I grasp. Uh, knowledges, how it was my taste, and I think that a lot of things that I'm hearing that uh, is, is is very valid, you know. And I think to me, all those questions about uh, what's the language of opera, what's the the guitar symptom of that is is have so much more connotations, because opera in China or in the rest of the world has so many different. I um, 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 we just. We feel like we have our, we own that opera, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's like another side of like Western opera. We're like, fuck, oh, but it's so late. We've been doing that for so long. <laughs> yeah. And then in the country, it's a way that um, it was a um, where we have so many different styles of, of, of opera. But nowadays, that uh, because of the language, a uh, disappearing of the language, a disappearing of dialects, uh, a lot of regional operas uh, has been facing out. But the problem is that, um, and I think the, the very forte of that is that the, the, the richness of, of, because when you think about opera, well, I'm just going to make a statement. <laughs> when I think about opera, it's really literally about like people getting together and, 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 and they, the composer was like, I wanted to tell a story. And I wanted to stage that. I was a little motivated. And then, and then, and then we stage. We need to stage that. We need to have a, a musical language that to tell the story. And then the direction, how to tell the story better. So in China too, that but the, the language itself is so much based on the music language itself is so much based on the dialects. And Mandarin is just one dialect. Cantonese is one dialect. We have like fifty six words. Um, and I see that in 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 actually in India as well, in many different places. So I actually wanted to start to to show you this uh, uh, my next initiative that I'm doing uh, before I talk about Andrew's song. So seeing that um, um, there's so many uh, regional operas that in China that I wanted to engage. I wanted to use my platform being that um, I have this interest. Um, stage that I'm a bit of outside of China. So I want to engage the regional operas. I want to bypass. Uh, they have their own um, composer team, um, but then what what they want is always that um, they wanted to compete for the provincial competition in order to get state grant. So the, when they when they tap to the provincial ones, those are the ones that it was very much top down. The local ones, however. Are the ones that they really know the language, they really just they incorporate with it. So I kind of wanted to bypass the provincials to and to have them to really work with. Um, so so the local logo and then the international or whatever crazy idea that might come from and just have sort of play around with ideas. So uh, so I was trying to my end game is 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 going to be ongoing um, project. But I have to start with somewhere. So this is the from uh, the regional <coughs> opera in Zhejiang uh, called uh, Xinzhou Diaoshan. And uh, I just used, uh, also collaborated with Thomas Tang, um, the architect with um, uh, graphic notation. And uh, this is one aria. She, the mother came back. She was in regret. Uh, she says that she sees the, she sees the, the deceased son Sorry, she's already deceased. She sees the son. She's she was regretting that how things cannot be done. So it was between the sea river and then. Oh no.
usurped. Um, uh, the, because when you listen to the traditional ones, it's always um, fall into the style. So when the style was like a dun, 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 dun. So I'm thinking, if we take out all that context of the musical context, what would be remaining? And what, could I really deal with the original, original thing? And then re really thinking about emotions and really think about the emotion-driven areas. And, and, it, and then in the end goal is to have new stories that are using those. So that's my ambition. So, okay. Um, maybe I should show you the end just well, Andrew's Bun um, is, is an, an opera that I, I composed, and it's about human trafficking and the virtual by um, West Africa. Yes. Like, don't know what should I 
talk about for more um, to talk about. Um, but I think that I, 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 I think I could say two things. And just one thing, really. Um, that I was adamant about um, uh, making sure that I can um, write a work that engages in social topics. And the other part of that topic is um, point was being um, a, a, a good piece of work that engages in social topic is not does not need to be political art. And to me, that's a completely different thing. Um, and also, I feel um, that who I am now uh, as part of the community and in the world, really, um, I have. I think as an artist, if you don't face, if you don't engage the part of dialogue, I just feel that I'm wasting such opportunity to have that mic. Um, because whenever you have um, people giving you this this luxury of having 10 minutes of chamber piece or having 85 minutes of, of opera or two hours, you literally are asking people to be in the room, to be with you, to go through that journey. And I feel that I want to say something that is in resonant with me. So that's that's why I'm, I'm, I'm it's not because it's in fashion. It's really it's really not because fashion comes and it goes, um, a hashtag comes and it goes. And and I think what needs to happen when I'm like look at things that why we need why we wanted to do this regional opera is because I, I see the need to address that. And and I feel like that what I can do um, better. I don't think that um, uh, this piece would solve the problem of human trafficking at all, um, but I think that um, it's, it's, it's good to, 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 to have a public awareness and uh, to, to have a, even a conversation piece. I think that it's, it's doing some work. Mm -hmm. But I do want to, uh, to show you like three minutes of the music video that um, it's seven minutes and I'm not showing all because we are running out of time. Of again, I'm born, I grew up in the 90s, so so music video is huge to me. So I always wanted to be Michael Jackson's thriller. <laughs> so I thought I have to do a music video based on Angel's phone. Um, so I engaged a team of young artists. And that's the so that music video is about have completely different narrative than the opera, but has the spirit of that. So this is I just want to show you this. Thank <laughs> you. 
is about rape, um, the girl being raped, and it was in the middle of the the, the, the climax, sort of, uh, of the opera, and she was trying to make a point that um, the, the, the extension of the voice in opera, and how that opens the doors, and, and how, how uh, something about it, what well, you should read it. But 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 I, I think to her she, because she interviewed the, the she she reviewed the piece so she she was talking about how this this part was really stuck out for her that um it's it seems that the in, it was emotionally driven for for me I was telling her that it's not because I thought uh, using a punk voice uh, Jennifer Charles who did uh, originally the role uh, did not read music and uh, she just I, I I sang and she just did it. By listening, because I think if we if we can all do be your cover, why can't we do half in in opera, you know? And um, and then so she did that, and 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 I think you know in the song in the moment that the girl is being raped, I just can't have Arias. You know, I think it needs to the woman needs to be rolling a little bit and needs to the emotional has to break down, and that's the true of of the story uh, art for me. So, yes. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll open up to questions. We also welcome the other panelists to ask questions we want to ask in the class about. Is there anyone in the audience? Yes, in the back. This is really an amazing piece of Um I'm wondering if that was created before, you know, for her some marketing purposes, or if that was a separate... No, 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 it's separate. Afterwards. <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. After we got the award, and then we found the money. <laughs> and, then, and then I said, well, since I now we have the money, why don't we burn it? <laughs> and, uh, no, um, no, I, I, I no. I, the truth of the matter is that I really, I always think that you know, for me, you, having a music video based on opera, I just think it's honestly, I just thought it was so cool. And I think there's no other like, I wish there's other scholarly reason behind it because having when I watch music video. Uh, to any kind of songs, and, and it, just, it, it remains that impact to me. Uh, and I was thinking, how can you have that to an opera that, because why we, we just have to have opera trailer? You know, I feel like that <coughs> is the essence of the nature of the, the, the spirit of that. The trailer is just excerpts, you know, and I think that's what music video is. I just wanted to broaden up that conversation a little bit. I think that if pop can do that, how oh, we can that too, you know? We, we, we have so many more, like, resources and the styles and, and people do drone effect calls, and why not? I mean, we all look at the pop thing, right? It's, it's just beat. It's an amazing beat. But the story goes to one story. But with an opera, the story is it's like life, it's messy. So we I just to me it's important to open up that door again. You were talking about you mentioned uh, engaging in social topics and making political art or not taking political art. What exactly is political art? Political art sometimes um what well, where I'm born uh, is uh, there is agenda. Uh, there is often the agenda is uh, is transmitted to you. Uh, it often uh, the state owns that agenda, and a lot of times, um, uh, new uh, countries now 
if you if you're at any kind of economical uh, economic uh, summit conferences, uh, uh, people working that they always talk about using culture as a soft power. So culture is always soft power to 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 navigate how countries deal with themselves. To uh, either it's 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 blatant or it's very soft. Right. So let's say we're gonna just have all those uh, American culture and those messages out. We, they always do that, it, no matter what kind of countries you come from. It's always, um, we can amuse our, ourselves that the nations don't do that, but they do. And that's what I learned um, being part of that dialogue. So where I'm come from is that also using that, really, to kind of overturn not, okay, maybe it's very controversial. <laughs> Um, some countries, like China or Pakistan, I just came back, back from Pakistan. If you say we're gonna do this, or if we're gonna, do, you might not go very far. But you can have a very smart way, smart approach about it. And I think it's about. I have a simple an analogy. Is that you know we always complain about our own mother. It's okay. If you say your mother is I'm like, oh. <laughs> so that's the psyche. It's, 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 to me, it's simple as that. It's, it's, um, it, those shortcomings, we all know that. But it's, but how you really understand the, uh, people's psyche and the sensitivity, and how can we use, not use, how can we navigate that sensitivity, and to really solve the things that we need to talk about, not just, there's no uh, one-sided democracy. No, there's not. There is just not a true democracy, whatever that means. And you guys are going to like, what? But anyway, so, so yes, that's another topic. Alright. I you in thinking about experimenting with the venue of opera performance, because the word opera serves with opera house and then it also certain kind of audience and so on. And whether um, you thought of producing an opera that's played in a conventional opera house, which causes an audience, and then taking it to a different kind of institutional venue or social I think venue. that's a conversation about producers. I think I'm, as an artist, I'm more interested in, in just doing my, what is content that my piece is going to be about. That to me is the most important thing. And then there's a, 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 the next process is navigation of the creative team, the producers, what is this for? And I think as an artist, for me, uh, the, the first, Foremost, it's not about them. <laughs> it's really not about it. It, it needs to be what is this? What is the thing that I'm talking about? Is it irrele relevant to me? Do I really want to talk about that story? Do I need wanted to invest my that money months or years to? I, no, I understand that. I mean, especially with George, where you probably perform in every kind of musical venue, but it's not possible. And also. To, but to, to see that as a way of reaching different kinds of audiences so that the very notion of opera shifts and it's the new part of your sort of social context. Sure. Really Otherwise it gets institutionally compartmentalized. Yeah, but, but isn't it a bit more beautiful that, you know, this kind of dialogue can also happen in the Met Opera House? And I think no, that... not excluding it from the Met, yeah, exactly. but taking it somewhere else at the same time. The exactly, like the multiplicity of the stage happening, and and when you look at Heiner's work, that it kept in head, like the two works that I saw at uh, Armory, one is the piano installation, like, is and then there's a grand, right, and he's also playing with scales too, even though it's in one venue, so the scale is different, and and the people, the audience is also different, in relation to the distance of the audience is also different, so so. The, the, the opera house is, as you all would have a lot of uh, thing to say that too. Um, it takes time. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> here at Columbia, I'm an alumnus and I used to teach here. Um, I read in the school papers the controversies regarding freedom of speech. And uh, I struggle with the creative aspects of subjectivity and whether I'm going to get in trouble and whether I'm actually going to be going to jail. So John Adams wrote in the past, Nixon in China, as a Chinese person, would you write an opera on Xi Jinping, or would you, as an American, write an opera on Trump? Good question. Good question. But then, my also, <coughs> the question back to you is, why would I? Not like, why would I not, or why would I guess, but through that story, what are we really talking about? And I think to me, that's the question that if I ever do a piece like that, and that's the first question I'm asking, what is that story? Am I talking about his thing? I'm talking about his statue? I'm talking about his ascension to power? I'm talking about his relationship of his wife and how he uses his wife? You know, so many things. What kind of Trump are we talking about? Talking about him being a character or, or, or something? What are we wanting to say through our work should be the most important thing. It's not the top itself. I know for a lot of producers, they can sell the tickets. Um, for me, I can't have that discussion before I know why I'm doing that. Otherwise, it's it's going to be lauded uh, for two years and then it's done. Do we have to move on or maybe another question? You can come to me. Okay. Maybe, maybe one more question. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, uh, thank you for this. Uh, I was struck by the fact that yesterday, um, this is also because of the colloquy that was just in jams about sexual violence and opera, and how yesterday we talked about Lisa Lodman, and then we saw the scene from Beatrice Chancy, which I didn't know at all, so thanks for introducing me. And then this scene, that, and the subject of your opera about uh, human trafficking, and thinking about um, the history of uh, sexual violence in canonical opera and how it is still part of what happens in opera, but in, in the context that you're describing it, it's a different agenda, perhaps, than what is happening historically. Can you say something about that? Just very quickly, um, I was also um, uh, make sure we did a lot of research, um, and it, this could, it takes like you know seven years, but not all the time, but it's just going through the stages. Uh, the more you, uh, research you do, the more un you understand human trafficking ha has so many shapes and forms, and, and it's also different regions of the world has the different epicenters and a different path of how human trafficking works. Um, Southeast Asia is completely different than East European, then <coughs> Mexico, and then for me, human trafficking is not just sex trafficking, it's also about voluntary labor and all that. So this piece is actually more about when you are presented to an opportunity to make exploitation to other people, what would you do? Because neither Royce and I are uh, victims of, of human trafficking, but I can see myself resonate with the middleman, because I feel like we can always want to pick up that $100 on the street. We always have. I had that thought, you know. But what about it's a million dollars, and you need to do the task too. You know? So where are that shift going to happen? And and if no one's looking, and you know, a lot of artwork has done that. But but I think when you position yourself in the more re uh, resonant, um, no, it's it might have a better. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'll let you know what I'll do. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> it is now my great honor to introduce uh, Joan LaBarbera. Joan LaBarbera's career as a composer, performer, sound artist explores the human voice as a multifaceted instrument, expanding traditional boundaries, creating works for multiple voices, chamber ensembles, music theater, orchestra, and interactive technology, developing a unique vocabulary of experimental and extended vocal techniques. She has premiered landmark compositions written for her by noted American composers, 
including work in Spotnik's chamber opera, Jacob's Room, the title role in Robert Ashley's opera, Now Eleanor's Idea, at Festival d'Avignon, and BAM's Next Wave Festival, Philip Glass and Robert Wilson's Einstein on the Beach, at Festival d'Avignon, Mark Morton Feldman's Three Voices, Steve Reich uh, drumming at New York's Town Hall, and John Cage's solo for Voice 45. <coughs> Studying voice at Syracuse and New York Universities in Tanglewood in the Berkshire Music Center, she also learned composition, learned her compositional tools as an apprentice with the numerous composers with whom she has worked for two decades. La Barbara served on the faculties of California Institute of the Arts, the Hochschule der Kunst in Berlin, the College of Santa Fe, and the University of New Mexico, as well as maintaining a private studio. La Barbara was artistic director of the Carnegie Hall series when Morty met John, celebrating the music of John Cage and Morty Feldman in the New York School. She is artistic director, curator, and host of Insights, a new series of encounters with distinguished composers for the American Music Center, and co-produces the EMF 10 concert series in New York City. Please help me welcome John La Barbara. Thank you. Um, and thank you, George, and Du Yun. Um, I always learn so much <laughs> um, when when I attend one of these things, and, and it's been really a pleasure to listen to both of you talk about your work and and how um, it fits into the, the greater context. Um, I wanted to talk about um, an opera that I have been developing for a book. 15 years. <laughs> um, I started in 2003 uh, with a work that I called at that time Wolf Song, um, inspired by the life and work of Virginia Woolf. And over the years, I, I have presented a number of different um, scenes, excerpts, uh, portions of this work. Um, at a certain point, I felt uh, the need to move a little bit away from Wolf, and I brought uh, into the stew um, the life and work of Joseph Cornell. Um, and people have asked me, how do these two artists relate? <laughs> um, I find them very, very unique and singular individuals who confronted um, in their lives uh, a great deal of um, pushback, let's say, um, notoriety, uh, very difficult circumstances in their personal lives. Uh, Virginia Woolf um, was deeply affected by the death of her mother at the age of 13. Um, her father, with her domineering uh, character, forced the family to live in full Victorian mourning for two years. Uh, after that point, um, he remarried, bringing her uh, into a situation where they had a blended family. One of her stepbrothers uh, sexually abused her. Um, that's a heavy story. Um, Cornell lost his father at the same age, 13. And his mother then, at a certain point in time, depended on Joseph, who was the eldest of four children, um, to become the breadwinner of the family. And Joseph was uh, then, in a way, forced out to uh, enter the same profession that his father had been in, that was um, selling textiles in the garment district here in New York. Um, his mother was uh, such an abusing character uh, that she becomes really overwhelming in his history, his story. Um, there's a, a, an uncomfortable anecdote uh, about uh, Joseph, who famously was unable to um, uh, consummate any real adult relationship. Um, the, the one uh, uh, exception was um, his relationship with uh, Yayoi. Uh, um, which 
it can be argued it was consummated or not consummated. But at a certain point, uh, they were um, uh, kissing in the garden uh, out in Thebes, and uh, mother came along and dumped a pail of water on them. If you can only imagine um, being a, a person who has difficulty uh, in human relationships to have this this uh, monster uh, come and do such a thing to you. So um, there, uh, when I imagine the opera, uh, and it is it is definitely still in development, I see. Uh, a kind of parallel stories going on. Um, so one side is, is Joseph's realm and one side is Virginia's realm, and they are separated by a water wall. Now what this water wall is, I don't know. Um, whether it's literally a water wall, whether it's a video wall, or whether it's a chorus. I'm still debating what this is. But the water wall is liminal so that characters and objects can flow between uh, these two realms. Um, when I started uh, with the <coughs> song, um, and I, I presented some scenes at um, uh, Issue Project Room when it was out on the Gowanus Canal. So of course I started outside at the canal uh, and had my characters um, uh, moving there alongside the canal and then working their way into that round, wonderful round silo room, uh, into a set that had been uh, constructed and designed by Mimi Lian, who's a wonderful, wonderful set designer. Um, and uh, the audience was right there, then placed in the midst of um, a, a British pub that somehow <laughs> magically appeared and I had uh, three dancers from the Jane Comfort uh, Company who were the whirling waitresses um, delivering the, uh, the puddings and, and the salads to the, the, uh, the people in the pub as the bombs were falling. This is uh, a scene from Wolf. Um, so afterwards, I opened it up for questions. And of course, the question is, are you going to deal with the suicide? Um, and I have wrestled with that for a long time. And what I finally decided is that in the opera, Virginia wrestles her way out of the water wall and throws the rocks back in. Um, and so we are in her mind. We're in perhaps her afterlife, but all of the things that she has experienced um, in her life, one of which uh, was that she imagined creating a time machine so that she could dial up a date and go back in time, of course, be with her mother, who was the most important and most pivotal person in her life. It's a very poignant idea, um, and um, I, I have a, a commission from Experiments in Opera to do uh, an aria for a voice and um, modular synthesizer that will be in November. And so I decided, well, how oh, perfect. Um, that's my time machine. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Miguel Frascone will be joining me in that. We'll be playing uh, the modular synthesizer. And uh, I am hoping that Lauren Flanagan, who plays the mother of Joseph in the song cycle, that. Uh, premiered last year, and we performed segments of uh, last Friday at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, is Virginia. And I met Lauren uh, about two years ago, um, and uh, she introduced herself to me at a, um, a conference that we were attending on grant writing. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I had not met Lauren, strangely enough, over all these years. And um, she, she introduced herself, and I said, oh, well, um, I'm writing an opera, and I think you would make a perfect Virginia Woolf. So Lauren will be my Virginia Woolf. She will also be Joseph's mother. And, and so traveling back and forth between these 
two realms. Um, this is sort of interesting. But the other thing about the water wall is that Cornell would go to the bay uh, in Queens and pick up the gifts that the water brought him. And so it, the, the water wall is really uh, primary for these two characters. Um, let's see, what else? Maybe we'll play, I have a very short excerpt from the song cycle. Um, here, these are four excerpts from a five set song cycle. The performers are uh, Lauren Flanagan, Mario Diaz Moresco, and Julia Meadows. Play the whole track? Yeah, it's only, it's less than five minutes. Yeah. <laughs>
I should also say that the, um, the musicians are members of um, Nextworks, which is the ensemble that I've worked with since uh, 2002. Um, and they're, they're really marvelous. I, I trust them greatly. But um, the sound that you heard right at the end uh, is Glass, played by uh, Miguel Fresco. He's known uh, as uh, one of the few musicians who plays Glass as an instrument. Um, also, the lyrics were written by um, Monique Trong, a marvelous uh, Vietnamese-American novelist who had never written um, lyrics before. Uh, and uh, I met her at Chiquita Ranieri in 2013. Uh, we were both there on an artist residency. And um, I read her novel, The Book of Salt, and I found it so overwhelmingly powerful uh, in the way that she um, built her characters. Uh, very, very uh, emotional, uh, very vivid characterizations. And so um, I asked her if she would be interested in, in writing a libretto for an opera. She said, yeah. <laughs> so um, being a historical novelist, uh, she has delved into the histories of, of Cornell and um, now is delving into uh, Wolf. Um, and so there's a lot of detail that goes into uh, the libretto that, that she's writing. Um, the libretto is very different from what we usually think of as the lyrics for an opera. Um, and so in a way, because it's dealing with so much detail, uh, I find myself writing in, in a particular way, so that um, I'm, in a way, illustrating the message of the words, uh, which is a very, very interesting thing to do. Um, when, when I first started working on Wolfsaw, uh, I was writing the libretto myself. <laughs> a difficult thing to do, as, as anyone who's ever attempted it. Um, and uh, I was leaning very heavily on Wolf's words. Um, and uh, I, I actually, the, the first version that I did, uh, I gave to the next works musicians uh, fragments of Wolf's text, three or four words taken from, from various things, and asked them to play the words. Uh, and I, uh, I allowed them to go at the material from different directions and come up with something. And the, the performance that we did in, in 2003 uh, at the Chelsea Art Museum, I distributed them around the room, open gallery space, uh, as if they had been tossed there by an unseen hand. Um, and the cellist, uh, in next works at the time, Ruben Codelli. Um, I said, can you play lying on your back? He said, sure, I do that all the time. <laughs> so, um, I, I wanted to um, put the musicians in a situation that they were the characters um, in, in the, the play, as it were. Um, and. When we, when we got to a production that I did at NYU in 2004, um, I, I really developed this idea of using the musicians as, as the characters in, in, um, in the opera. So there were confrontations um, uh, between 
the, the instrumentalists, uh, and I was playing with Jimmy Wolf at that point in time. Um, and so uh, it, was, it was a very interesting thing. And I remember um, asking Cornelius to follow, to uh, walk up, across upstage, and every once in a while play a violin, every once in a while to just turn and stare at the audience. Um, if you've ever dealt with a musician and asked them to act, um, <laughs> uh, it's a very difficult thing. Some musicians are very good at it. Uh, Cornelius, whom I adore, um, was, is, is about as wooden an actor as I can imagine. But it was an interesting um, uh, proposition to, to give him this, this task and, and to uh, actually ask him to be part of the, the tableau, which is really, really a kind of fascinating thing. Um, I was interested in the question that was asked uh, about um, the circumstance of where you produce an opera. So, as I said, I, I did uh, some in an art museum, uh, a gallery more than a museum, uh, I did some presentations at Issue Project outside, indoors. Uh, Friday, we did a presentation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, when, I, when I agreed to do that, uh, they showed me a number of different spaces. And um, one of them was the Grace, Grace Rainey Rogers Auditorium. And I thought, well, it's perfect. I'll just do the song cycle. And then they said, well, actually, um, that's not one of the venues you can use. <laughs> uh, and so uh, I said, OK. Um, and uh, the Cornell exhibition, which is still up, by the way, you should get there quickly, because I think it's, it's uh, closing at the end of the month. Um, so I thought, well, OK, we'll do it in the Cornell exhibition. Um, and. Um, they also showed me this wonderful long gallery, uh, the Contemporary Gallery, um, huge, long, uh, rectangular space with big skylights. And they said, well, you know, sometimes we perform there. When I saw the size of the Cornell exhibition, it's about the size of this room. So there's no possibility of getting an audience in there. Um, so what I decided was, um, to start with um, a work of mine called Windows, which um, was put together from about 13 years of the development of Wolf Song, um, and um, is a, a kind of sound painting that begins in uh, Wolf's mind. It goes through my interpretation of the voices, uh, and gradually moves into a territory where Cornell comes in. Very, very abstract piece. So I did that, it's an 18 minute uh, piece, as the opening of the presentation that we did on Friday. Um, and the audience um, was standing. And I explained that at the beginning of this that we would start with windows and then um, Lauren Flanagan, as Joseph's mother, would begin uh, one of the songs with Miguel Frescoli playing flute from a balcony at one end of this huge rectangular space, and Lauren coming from the opposite end. Uh, and the, eventually, we would walk up a flight of stairs, this is an audience of about 200 people, and arrive upstairs where um, uh, Joseph's mother would uh, address Joseph, um, from the length of another very long gallery, uh, at which point she starts to harangue him <coughs> about uh, what, what he does is not really working, his father really worked, um, and uh, at, at the end of this piece she tells him to, to put away his toys, his glue pots, and his papers, and get a job. Uh, it's, it's a very, very uh, heart-rending, heart-wrenching uh, text, and uh, the, the singers are, are just 
exquisitely beautiful. So, um, having prepared the audience for that, they actually did it. And so we moved from the one space uh, through the long gallery and up the stairs. And, and so Lauren and Mario then have this wonderful uh, duet at the end of it. So the idea of taking opera uh, out of the concert hall and putting it in various uh, different kinds of situations is something that I've been dealing with for a long time. And I know that, that Yuval is very interested in um, taking opera outside of the, the concert uh, situation and exposing the audience to it. What I found really wonderful um, actually was um, during the rehearsal in the afternoon when the museum was open, um, people were wandering around in the galleries and all of a sudden my singers start singing, you know, and uh, there was a, a lot of reaction. Um, some people just kept walking, <laughs> uh, but some people stopped and listened and then came up afterwards and had many, many questions about you know, what we were doing, what was this all about, and I explained that we were doing a full performance at 6 o'clock and they, they should come back, and they did, which was really wonderful. So those people experienced it in a kind of pop-up situation. Um, whereas when we actually began the concert at 6 o'clock that evening, um, it, it was a, a more formal understanding that, that they were going to experience this uh, in a very different way. So, um, yeah, it's the, the whole idea of where you do opera is um, it's fascinating uh, because we have come to think of opera in the historical context. Um, the Met you know, being one of the, the supreme uh, venues for traditional opera. Um, I think the Met has had difficulty doing contemporary opera. Um, I, I think of um, Kaya Sariaho's beautiful opera, L'Amour de Noir, that I saw in Santa Fe a number of years ago on a gorgeous set where they had actually flooded the stage of, of the Santa Fe Opera. And there were two towers, um, one uh, for the, the, the Princess Countess and, and one for the, the Troubadour. And then there was a, a boat of light that traveled from one tower to the other. And at the end uh, of the opera, um, the, the singer is lying in the water, singing this incredibly beautiful uh, aria. When they did it at the Met, they did it with LEDs. And I was sort of disappointed, and, and I found that the, um, the mechanical structure of the boat uh, confused because um, it, it doesn't actually travel anymore. Uh, it comes out, it opens up, and it, it went back. Um, I, I think, in a way, sometimes the set can overwhelm the production. Uh, and I, I found that the, the production uh, in Santa Fe was, was so integral to the story and, and really made so much sense that I was very disappointed when I saw it at the Met. Um, Anyway, uh, now that I'm, I'm seriously getting into uh, writing this opera, I'm, I'm struggling with where do we do it? Do you do it in a, in a traditional space? Do you do it in a proscenium space? Uh, do you do it in a black box? What, what would be the perfect setting? And I really don't know yet what that setting is. Um, but um, moving along with it, um, as I said, the, the song cycle was a way of really uh, putting the material out there, dealing with words, um, and uh, as I move forward, um, we'll have to deal with the dramatic element of it all. So. I'd just like to start out by asking, I love the pairing of Cornell with Virginia Woolf, I think, the, the, the uncanny similarities. I would say they both almost have an aesthetic of claustrophobia in some way. 
in many of the books and novels, you feel like we're sort of trapped inside someone's head, whether it's a character, but we're trapped in the wolf's own head, of course, the Cornell boxes. Uh, I saw your wonderful performance at Resident Bodies, I think it was last year, yeah. and of course, you know your work, and I've always been struck that there's a sort of sense of inter interiority in much of your in much of your uh, vocal productions. It's almost like you're in your head and we're in your mouth and it's sort of aesthetics of, of, of interiority. So obviously there's some link there between the Cornell and the wolf and and, uh, and and those kinds of those kinds of sounds that you're that you're interested in making. I wonder if you're going to be exploring that in the opera and how much that might grate against a genre like opera which is about projection and exteriorization. Yeah, um, when, when I describe this work, um, I'm, I'm also thinking of the difficulty that, that we all experience as artists, getting what is most perfect in the mind out into some way of communicating to the public. And that's a very, very difficult thing. And so in exploring uh, Wolf, who uh, said that she she heard her novels first as music and translated them from music that was in her mind into words. Um, and that, that to me is a really fascinating idea. Um, Cornell, of course, uh, lived greatly in his mind, um, fantasizing about particularly women, with whom he could never have a relationship. Um, so the idea of the interiority, I think, is very important to me. Um, I do use it a lot in my work. Um, I'm, I'm always exploring uh, some principles, some ideas, some concept. Um, I've done a number of works um, inspired by paintings, by different um, concepts, my uh, compositional process often involves writing, writing words, and stream of consciousness. So whatever my topic is, uh, I will just start writing and uh, try not to, to censor uh, and just do a whole brain dump and then uh, go back and read the words and find the music from, from the words. So that whole idea of going from the mind into the creation of something is, is very important to me. Um, I've, I've also encountered the question, well, you know, you do extended vocal techniques. Is that going to be part of this? And it will. Actually, Lauren and I have been talking about it. And um, she is just dying to learn some extended vocal techniques. So we'll be, we'll be dealing with that. Um, at a certain point. How that will all work, uh, I'm not really sure, but uh, what I want to do is to combine um, more traditional elements of vocalizing and instrument playing with what I call sonic atmosphere, which is my own way of, of layering uh, disparate elements into recordings. And so they will uh, the sonic atmosphere will form the kind of foundation um, underneath the, the sort of underpinning of, of the work. Um, and that I, I really hear these uh, arias uh, kind of floating on top of that. So, long answer. <laughs> question, but it, it was sort of interesting to me when you talked about the, was it an incident? Is this, you know, I guess, really happened? The Cor Cornell Kusama kissing incident in which the mother dumped water in her heads. And I just wanted to, this is part one, I want to say, I just wanted to take a poll, just in your own mind, you don't have to make a show of it. <laughs> was the first thing you thought was Cornell's mom was suppressing his sexuality, number one, or choice to didn't like Asians and didn't want her um, uh, didn't want her son consorting with them. Now this is the era of high American eugenics and segregation. So I have to admit that it was option B that occurred to me first. Really? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so that's very interesting because <laughs> it produces very different 
most because that's that's sort of my subject position and experience. And so that's sort of the thing that you have to imagine that certain opera goers confronted with that as a team might go there instead of instead of to the instrument. And they might want to do both. The second thing I noticed just as a just as a, a mode of thinking about the panel as a whole is that we haven't had any more questions about the propriety of the use of canonical Western modes of vocal production. And so I think that's interesting to me because I think that each of us, as we've gone through, have used these modes to, per, to um, express a variety of historical and subject positions. That's already kind of a delexicalization of that, of that mode of um, the foreign. So, and it reminded me of a piece I went to a long time ago. This is the Worcester Group's performance of a piece called Roots 1 and 9. And the idea of the Roots 1 and 9 was that it used uh, blackface in order to uh, express uh, whatever they were trying to express. It was wildly unsuccessful. And so, but, but the thing was, I'm betting that these canonical modes of Western vocal production are more malleable in what they can signify than blackface. But if they're not, we're in a lot of trouble. So if they're not, they're, if, if these modes, if black, if these modes of Western vocal production the ones that people were complaining about earlier, um, are no more malleable than what they can signify than blackface, then we're in a lot of trouble <laughs> with regard to what's possible in the world of opera. <clears throat> so that, then this was brought up by the Cornell Sama example. Yeah, interesting. I, um, I don't think you have anything to do with um, uh, her being Asian. I think I think the mother was just um, didn't approve of it. She she wanted to be the sole woman in his life. I think it's it's much much deeper Could than. Could be both, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I I just having read um, Deborah Solomon's uh, Utopia Part One. <clears throat> which is a, a biography of Cornell. Um, I just, I, I found her a monstrous character. Um, and I've talked to Carolee Schneeman uh, about it. Carolee was, was one of Cornell's uh, assistants at a certain point in time when she was young. Um, and uh, she said that the mother was just an absolute monster. Um, so, that's that's where uh, I, I come to this this uh, situation. I don't know that I would depict that particular scene. Uh, I think it's it's so loaded. Um, there are so many other things that I would rather deal with. Um, really, uh, Cornell making the boxes. His, his solitariness, his going out on his bicycle, um, picking up detritus from the, the World's Fair grounds uh, out in Queens, and, and uh, where he would just pick up things all over the place and bring them back and, and file them uh, into these little boxes that he had, this incredible filing system of, of all of these things. So it's, it's that aspect um, of his, again, back to the question about the interiority, um, his, his dealing with what was in the mind, and his, his never traveling much beyond Queens. Uh, he would come into Manhattan, uh, where he worked, and, and he would gather things there. But the idea that a lot of his boxes dealt with um, particularly French ideas, uh, a lot of French language in the boxes, um, uh, fantasy, the, the dealing with, with children. Um, one of the interesting things that I learned also was that there was a little girl uh, that lived uh, nearby in Queens. And uh, she would come by and Joseph would give her a box to play with. And she'd take it away and play with it. And when she was done with it, she'd bring it back and she'd say, Okay, I'd like another one now. He'd give her another box. Um, and it's, it's uh, he, 
tremendous, in a way, kind of adoration of, of children uh, is, is a very important aspect uh, of, of who he was. Um, it, it's, just, it's so complicated. Yeah, I think now that hearing this, <laughs> um, just speaking from personal history, I think that, you know, especially the queens and, and the, in the whites and queens, there are a lot of Chinese and the mothers not approval of dating the Asian girl, dump of water. It's not a read. If, if I see, if I, because, you know, I'm You're saying, I not only, no, no, not no, only no. have to deal with the suicide, I now have to yeah, deal with Yeah, no, the because I was thinking, if I were dating him at the time, <laughs> no, right, because that's how you, you, you engage this kind of story. So if, if the mother dumped a water on me, and I, you know, so you have to, I understand that, I understand, I think at first you're like, huh, evil <laughs> mother, and before you, you don't think that, you're like, what did I do wrong? You know, and then the, the other thing is like, I didn't do anything wrong, so maybe it's the other things. So I think that's the always like when you are um, a woman of color and you know in the thing you always think like what people shoot you something you're like what did I do wrong? <laughs> and and you the, the second thing is like you know and then you're like I didn't do anything wrong, and then should I do something about it? And then I think that was like almost like three steps. As as a citizen, you know, as an artist, that's a completely different thing. Um, but but I agree with you, and and I think those and and the racial thing is always an evolving thing. Nowadays, China um using blackface. Oh, it's so bad and so sad, and they don't understand what that means. So. Well, maybe they do. I, I mean, they like, don't. I that's, mean, that's, that's I, I mean you know, but it's not hard to figure out. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, exactly. It, it takes me back to the ship building exam, which is to say that musicologists somehow couldn't read that understanding. But I'm sure Louis Anderson could. You know, he wasn't that naive. I mean, the guy did an opera about children of uh, so the naivete in this case is sometimes, uh, you know, an issue because what happens is that opera maybe has to think more about living in a globalized environment where there are uh, that creolizing environment, race, uh, ethnicity, gender, are taken into a sort of an intersectional account. And so I didn't see, I could see the intersectionality in that story, for me, where both could be an issue. Uh, and the queens of the 30s and 40s were not the queens of today. No. Yeah. So, um, so there is a lot of possibilities for that. I just want to bring, bring that out, but also to make the point that um, the stereotyping of vocal production is only capable of expressing a limited set of positions, one that opera has pushed back on for a few hundred years now. And so it's only today that perhaps we expect opera to be like biopics, where the, the guy who's on the screen has to look like the person who, <laughs> who is being depicted or something like that. We'll take just one more question. Um, it's an observation, obvious one about cold water. Um, did, you, did she throw it off the first woman or the man? Did you say to a man, go get a cold shower? Like the famous, get rid of the arrows. Right? <laughs> um, so there's so. Stage again, so it very much dependent on the man or the woman. So it's on the woman, it would very much come across against the woman. You've heard on the man, and you go get a cold shower. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it wouldn't that be the equivalent of gold water treatment? Yeah, you wash yourself. I think it's interesting. The
different in the direction. I understand, but I'm saying you can also be <laughs> wash yourself. Water right. is washing its many. Yeah. It's not just. Can I make yeah. a better comment about all of this? I mean, I'm, I mean, one of the things I'm most surprised with today is that like a a panel on experimental opera how first defined has ended up becoming a discussion about like character motivation. You, you know, like what one character on stage is intending or thinking and how you would interpret it. Um, I mean and I mean you know there's been a discussion throughout the whole conference of like what what is opera and what is opera today and yesterday and you know, it's like, is, it, is it something specifically Wagnerian? Is it some sort of inherited conventions? I mean to me the the only thing I could say that I mean, this, that I think the three of you would all agree with is that it seems, or the thing that all the three projects you're describing all seem to most have in common is really that they're, that they're telling stories and that the narrative, but in a way that doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to have to be what opera is or how people would describe it. So I'm just curious if, like, you know, as, as composers, like, if, like, is that, like, if you had to say this is what, like if somebody says write an opera for me, do I think that means you know I'm going to be telling a, a story with people in it, for example? Um, I don't think I was telling a story. No, I mean there might have been a few small stories inside, but I think it was testified yesterday pretty well by Nia. Um, I think it's opera positions and ideas and testaments. So in the end. Uh, people, it's sort of in a way it could be considered to be the expression of a community voice along the lines of Tony Morrison's, or it could be an interior dialogue with a, well, a rather fragmented personality that's going from a lot of different views about where do we position ourselves in terms of identity, and uh, how do we position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the world which looks at us in a very different way, and how we look at ourselves, that's not so much a story as it's a testimony. And so that's how I'm looking at it. Now, stories, um, and most of the people who have reviewed it sort of felt that I should have stuck with the story. But then, <laughs> but then uh, that's what I read about the Granite, the Fernigo opera as well. And so, well, where's the story, man? <laughs> so, but maybe the idea is there that um, the automatic assumption is that the stories are being told when it might be that other kinds of narratives or even non-narrative modes of addressing history are on offer. I'd like to thank all of you panelists. <laughs>